Today's one hour webinar is led by Timothy Musak, and he's going to be discussing the AMA Guides Chapter 13. We have our entire AMA analysis and rating department on the call today. We're going to start with introductions. Susan, would you like to introduce yourself first? Hi, I'm Susan Kalias. Um, I've been in the work comp industry longer than I care to admit. Um, I've done I'm doing ratings now for three years. Before that, I have was a hearing rep and um, specialized in liens and lots of a claims supervisor, claims examiner. I've done it all pretty much. So anyways, um, glad to have you all here. If we can ever help, please contact us. Thank you. Okay, Kenny. Yeah, yeah. hi everyone. My name is uh, Kenny Tolbert. I've been in the ratings department for Bradford Barthel for about six months now. Uh, I hope this webinar serves you well. I, I think you're in for a treat because honestly, chapter 13 is my favorite chapter in the whole guy's book. So I think this I'm a little biased. I, I have a background in neuroscience. I think it's fascinating. So good to be here with all of you. So thank you. And I'll uh, pass it off to Don. Thank you. Hey, hi, everybody. Happy day before Friday. Uh, I want to thank you also for uh, joining us. I know you have very busy schedules and it's tough to make it, but I think you're going to find this very valuable. Uh, Tim has no uh, uh, no equal when it comes to the AMA guides, well, the entire department, I should say that. By the way, the picture of me down there, yes, you may have guessed it's almost 25 years old because uh, we put that up when we started the firm a quarter of a century ago. We're going to be having a new website. And unfortunately, my updated picture is going to go in there. So you don't want to look at that because it's really, really ugly. Um, back to Tim. He's been doing this for about three decades. So he knows all his stuff. I'll give you some particulars about that. But first, you know, I'm, I, I, I do really bad jokes and riddles. So here's the bad one for today. What do you call a boomerang that doesn't work? A stick. That's what you call a dad joke. <laughs> Feel free to share it with the kids. At least it's clean, right? All right. Back to Tim. His knowledge of the ADA, the 97, the 2013, the 2005 permanent disability uh, rating schedules is unequal. Um, he knows everything. He knows so much about uh, the PD that he's even been called as a defense expert witness on the thing. Uh, Tim and his department, Kenny and Susan, um, have reviewed literally literally tens of thousands of reports to make sure that they accurately reflect, accurately reflect the amount of WPI and thus the amount of PD. And they find that over 80% of the time, the doctors, I believe it's 81% of the time, the doctors overstate the amount of PD you own. And so their job is identify, identify and they have tens of millions of dollars in potential savings to clients. Uh, because they don't do just a, like a string rating. You see those all the time, and that's what you'll get from the rater down at the board. They do a full, uh, they fully analyze and an annotate the reports, its shortcomings, its out, they outline sections that either need to be um, 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 bolstered or undercut if you're attacking the report and want to kick it out of evidence. Um, clients, um, other, every def other defense law firms uh, utilize their services. Um, for a whole host of reasons uh, to help them prepare for requests for supplemental reports, to take doctor depositions, to take rater depositions, drafting points and authorities, crafting uh, petitions for reconsideration, the the whole um, the whole uh, what just about anything you can possibly think of. Very 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 valuable. Uh, like I say, over 80% of the time um, they're going to identify savings for you. Actually, 2% of the time. The doctors understate the level of PD, and I think they've just made a mistake. So strongly recommend you utilize them. I should say, um, this is how strong I think they are. I actually um, uh, founded the, the, uh, the department um, back a million years ago, and my name is on the, as an editor of the sixth edition of the AMA Guide to Evaluation of Permanent Impairment. That having been said, when I'm going to do a doctor deposition or need to do points and authorities, I go to these folks because they do it every single day. They do it more efficiently, more effectively, and know the AMA guides better than I do at this point. So they're the way to do, they are the way to go. Completely unrelated issue. If you've got questions about COVID or need representation, we've got a dedicated COVID task force who have handled hundreds of COVID cases. 
soup to nuts from basic denials to multiple death cases. Questions or referrals on that, happy to answer any questions you have, and there are a lot of COVID questions. Um, just go to our dedicated email address. That's COVID at BradfordBarthel.com. Real easy to remember, COVID at BradfordBarthel.com. Um, finally, if you're not getting our weekly newsletter, the uh, b, &B blog, uh, you're missing out. Please uh, uh, email Tammy and she'll get you on the list. Uh, we've got a, a different article uh, or articles pretty much every week. And we've got multiple uh, hundreds of articles, past articles um, on our website, the uh, BradfordBarthel.com. Uh, you'll find, like I said, hundreds of articles, some of which uh, include more recently how to use the post term defense uh, effectively, ways to fight COVID claims, uh, consolidation defenses, etc. Highly valuable, really recommend it to you. All right, well, I've talked way too much and told way terrible wit riddles, so I'm going to kick it on over to Tim. Tim, break a leg. Thank you, Don. Uh, I'm Tim Musak. Um, in the ratings department, uh, my background is in claims. Been doing it a long time. Before I started for Bradford Barthel, I was I was doing ratings and training through the IEA, uh, along with uh, working on claims. Um, as Don reminded me yesterday, yesterday I started my 14th year with Bradford Barthel, and if you figure about 2,000 hours a year with the AMA guides, we've got some experience here. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, so here we go. We're going to get started, but first, Tammy's going to ask a couple of questions, and here we go. Thanks. We're going to start with a few poll questions. This will give Tim an idea of where you're all at with ratings, your knowledge, and how many you've done this year. So this first question is, as you can see it on your screen there, I see you're already answering, <laughs> how many ratings have you completed since January? You have four options there, zero, one to five, five to ten, or more than ten. And clearly, you all have done this before because over half of you have already selected your uh, your answer. So I'm gonna, just going to give it a few more seconds here. How many ratings have you completed since January? Okay, I'm going to close it. That's a, that's a pretty good spread. That's good. We've got 19% that haven't done any ratings and 31% have done more than 10. So we've got a pretty good spread of experience here. Thank you for answering. And question number two, what is the occupational group number for an electrician? Again, you have four options, 250, 370, 380, or 490. If you have your PDRS handy, you could look that up too, right, Tim? <laughs> Indeed you do. Maybe some of them know by heart because a lot of them answered very quickly. It looks like a lot do. We have over 300 people attending. I, I Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, and over half have responded to this. Yep. Uh, the, the correct answer is group 380. I'm not expecting anybody knows that off the top of their head, but you know how to find it. But man, oh man, 63% of you had that right. That's uh, So we've got some experienced raters here. Thank you. That's awesome. Last question. What does chapter 13 of the AMA Guides 5th edition cover? The upper extremities, the visual system, the central and peripheral nervous system, or none of the above? Chapter 13 is what Tim's going to be discussing today. So he wants to know, what does chapter 13 of the AMA Guides cover? I will close that in three seconds. And Tim, again, it looks like most people know the answer. Most people know the answer. And more than anything, I just want to say how much I appreciate that you're assisting us by responding. 66% of our 300 plus people attending responded to that. So thanks very much. That really does help. And the correct answer is the central and peripheral nervous system. That's what we're going to do. Um, so we're going to look at AMA guides and as it pertains to ratings, um, we've got we've got a good variety of experience uh, attending. So here we go. Um, starting with just reviewing WPI reporting in general, uh, what we want to do when we're looking at uh, doctor's report and addressing WPI, what we do in the rating department, what you'll be doing if you're not doing it already in 
in your at, your at your desk is is the doctor explain the WPI? Not just do they tell you what it is, but they explain it. Um, objective findings documented in the report should lead the doctor to the correct chapter, table, class, or category. And there's some discretion the doctor has. Um, we can check by reading the relevant part of the guide, the introduction to that chapter, the applicable section, tables and figures, and examples. Um, Don mentioned that we see doctors um, sometimes aren't accurate. Um, sometimes it's an easy fix and sometimes it's not. Uh, when it's an easy fix, boy oh boy, we should take advantage of that. If it's not an easy fix, I, I recognize that there's, there's, there's a lot of work can be involved in that, but the easy fix is let's go get those. Um, overall, the AMA guides discusses for WPI, for there to be disability, permanent disability, it's number one got to be permanent, and that's always been the case. Uh, but the AMA guides covers that additionally throughout several different chapters and sections of the of that book. They've got to be objective, not subjective, but objective, and the AMA guides covers that in quite a few portions of the AMA guides. And it's got to be non-overlapping, so it's not the same ADLs um, uh, affected by the lumbar spine and the right knee. And the AMA guides covers that as well, uh, pretty well. Um, so here we go. A couple of things that we want to make sure we're paying attention to when we are um, doing ratings is we want to make sure we're getting the right impairment value. We only rate whole person impairment, uh, particularly when we're looking at chapter 16 and 17, which cover the upper extremities and the lower extremities. The values are probably upper extremity and lower extremity values that the doctor's initially re reporting and recording. And, and they need to be converted to whole person impairment. Typically, the doctor does that, but not always, and not always correctly. So those, that sometimes is an easy fix. Uh, there are a couple of tables, chapters three and four, chapter 17, uh, chapters, uh, those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head, where a doctor, by, at chapter 15, the, there are some tables that have upper and lower extremity values in them where the doctors are not looking for those to be lower extremity values. So they're reporting them as whole person impairment when they're not. So that's another easy fix if you see that. So that's why we check, we check those kind of things. That's what you want to do when you're rating a report. You want to double check those, get those easy fixes. Um, other things that there's sometimes errors is interpolation. Every table within the AMA guides does not cover every single number, so you have to fill in the gaps. You got to interpolate. If if um, you're looking at a shoulder motion of 160 degrees and 170 degrees are in the figure in chapter 16, maybe the measurement is 165. You got to figure out where that should be in the impairment values. Uh, combining impairments, a uh, limit of 100 percent. CVC value or the CVC uh, table is statutorily the right way to do it. I mean, that's presumed correct. Um, and that considers potential and probable overlap among multiple disabilities. So um, here we go. Rating corrections, the easy fixes. We, we can do them. Probably want to get the doctor to agree that that was just an error. We can, we can point out what, what the doctor did. We can point out what the AMA guide says, what the instruction is, what that table says. And often those can be easy fixes. Um, sometimes if you need help, the DEU can help you with that. They will make corrections when they're, rate, when they're doing a rating. They will fix figure numbers, uh, values that are taken incorrectly from a table or figure within the AMA guides. Um, they will sometimes note potential misinterpretations of the guides. One I looked at again recently, a DEU rating, this was for chapter 15, the spine. The doctor, the QME gave range of motion method for the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and the lumbar spine. And the DEU rater says, I can't rate this. You gotta pick one, you can't do all three. So sometimes the DEU raters are pointing us in the right direction and pointing the doctors in the right direction. So let's, let's take those easy fixes. So now we're gonna look at chapter 13 and there are several things in here that I'm gonna look at. I've got a ton of slides. I'm not gonna cover them all in detail because I am gonna do my very best to get us out of here at 
noon or at one. And I think I've got a question coming in already. Yeah, this question is from Alex. It's uh, does this have does this chapter have to be used by a neurologist only, or can any doctor use it? <sighs> any doctor that feels they've got the ability to use it can use it. Um, it's it's geared more for the neurologist, but that doesn't mean an orthopedist can't use it. Um, it and it depends on what they're evaluating. It's. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll cover more about that, but thank you for that. Is there another question? No, I think okay, it. thank you. I'll, thank I will I will cover more about that. Um, this is the central peripheral nervous system. So theoretically, based on the AMA guides and authors of the AMA guides, this this chapter is used if there's a central peripheral nervous system injury. It's not used for uh, a knee uh, a knee injury that's not related to a nerve injury. Um, it's not for an arm. It's not for a lot of other things. It's peripheral nervous system injuries. Um, but there's there's a couple of things I do want to make sure I talk about. I want to talk about cerebral impairments on page 308, uh, frequently misused by doctors that are evaluating brain injuries. Mental status impairment, frequently not used correctly by doctors that are evaluating brain injuries. I want to talk about Table 13.8, which is emotional or behavioral disorders uh, due to uh, a nerve injury, a central peripheral nerve injury, a brain injury typically, or a GAF for a psych injury. Only one should apply. Sometimes doctors um, look to try to to do both and only one of those should apply it's either a brain injury or it's a psychiatric injury it's not not both uh, if it is both there's overlap cranial nerves I want to go through those a little bit most specifically trigeminal nerve that's another uh, impairment that doctors are using incorrectly pretty frequently I think they're being taught that way and then I want to talk about chapter 13 by analogy. A lot of doctors do use chapter 13 by analogy. So it's not that they're not neurologists doing it wrong. It's just that they're looking for an easy way to rate. And sometimes chapter 13 on its face can look easy. Um, chapter 13 has cautions about subjective findings. And uh, subjective is not enough. It talks about specific uh, exams that can be used, specific types of diagnostic studies that can be helpful in, in understanding what the injury really is, the diagnosis and the severity of the injury. All impairment classes, all WPI throughout the AMA guides talks about ADL abilities um, and uh, deficits as a result of the injury in those ADL abilities. So in my mind, they're there might be overlap among different body parts. Um, so I want to talk here the central nervous system disorders. This is the this is the cerebral impairments, and uh, this section 13.2 of the AMA guides, page 308, talks about central nervous system disorders and these tables. I'm going to look at them here. The central and peripheral nervous system. These impairments and tables within the AMA guides chapter 13 talk about these different impairment values. These all are considered cerebral impairments. They're identified and defined in AMA guides as cerebral impairments. The instructions on page 308 for evaluating cerebral impairments is that they're all cerebral impairments. There's overlap. You only use the highest. And many neurologists seem unaware of that instruction. And the instruction isn't there to, to cut down on uh, appropriate impairment for an injured worker. It's acknowledging there's absolutely overlap. They're all recognizing and they're all addressing a brain injury or central nervous system injury that causes one or more of these issues. And only one can be used for that. It's gotten easier for us now because the arousal disorder, 13.03.00.00, is the sleep disorder, which for dates of injury 1-1-2013 and later, 
are statutorily precluded, so we don't need to worry about that. But the others, only one, only the worst one. Um, and here's the chart and uh, the table 13.1 that tells you, summarizes that only the greatest can be used. It's talked further on table th on page 308 of that chapter. So now I'm just going to go through these tables, and this is really intended just to <laughs> just just because it's I found it was not easy to figure out which impairment number went with one table. So this is kind of a guideline what impairment number from the rating schedule goes with what table. So this one, table third or impairment number 13.01.00.00, it's for consciousness and awareness. And this is altered state of consciousness is what, what this is. And the AMA guides gives the example of Parkinson's disease. So it's a, a temporary, likely a temporarily um, altered state of consciousness. Table 13.3, impairment number 13.02000, is for episodic loss of consciousness or awareness. So it's not just altered state, it's loss, and they give the example of epilepsy. So um, actually loss of, of consciousness for some period of time. So those, that's the differentiating, differentiation between the two. Only the greatest gets used. Uh, table 13.4, sleep and arousal disorders. When that was uh, a compensable consequence, only the greatest of any of these cerebral impairments could be used. Um, but it's statutorily precluded. And I want to relay a story, a deposition recently taken by one of our attorneys. We had a doctor, a neurologist, that included included sleep disorder and several other things. This state of injury was like 2017. And the attorney says, doctor, do you know that that's statutorily precluded, that we can't, we're not going to give any additional impairment for that? And the doctor said, yeah, I know that. I'm gonna put it in there anyway. Maybe it'll slip by. He didn't say maybe it'll slip by, but maybe it'll slip by somebody. Um, tables 13.5 and 13.6 go together for mental status. Some doctors will ref reference it as clinical dementia rating. I'm not gonna go through the whole deal here, but what I do wanna point out is most doctors, if they're evaluating, when they're evaluating mental status, they are skipping right to table 13.6 and picking a number. And it's not that simple according to the AMA guides. You, you gotta first go through some actual data and collect some data, and here's what the data is. And then you gotta follow the instructions, and the instructions are um, on page 319. There's specific instructions on what to do with that data, and those instructions tell you where you go on table 13.6. So the point I wanna make, I'm not gonna go through the whole process, the point I wanna make is if you have a doctor give, offering impairment for mental status, uh, it, it may be valid, but it may not be accurately calculated, and uh, that might be a quick fix. Some neurologists don't like to be corrected on that, but still, if they're not doing it right, they should be asked to do it right. And very few that I see do this right. They, they're, they're ignoring the instructions on page 319. They're ignoring this table 13.5, which is an integral part of that evaluation process. And they're going right there and they're picking a number. I think this person's class two, 20% WPI. Why, doctor? Well, because they're, they're complaining of memory problems and concentration problems. Well, that's not enough. It really is supposed to be objective. There really is supposed to be data. There really is supposed to be a process in terms of the evaluation. So my recommendation um, is if you have that in a report, take a look at it or have somebody take a look at it and see if the doctor really did follow instructions and really did do an evaluation or if the doctor made an off-the-cuff, pick a number out of a hat, assessment from table 13.6. Um, table 13.7, you know what, I already forgot about this. Um, this is language, so if a cerebral head injury um, or 
spinal nerve injury causes difficulty with speech, uh, this table is what would apply. And that's impairment number 1305. And the last one within the cerebral impairments is table 13.8, which is emotional behavioral disorders. As I suggested earlier, um, we only use the that impairment if um, it's a head injury, a brain injury, or central nervous system injury that's causing the emotional behavioral disorders. If it's a psychiatric injury, it's evaluated in the GAF system, that, that methodology. I, not both. If you don't get both. You get one or the other. And in terms of overlap, as a summary, the cerebral impairments, or here we go, page 325 of the AMA guides talks about the emotional behavioral disorder. Um, you use it, you use that in one in situation and you use chapter 14 and the GAF system in another situation. So here's what Cerebral impairments, my, my point is, here we go, maybe you've got all these different things as, assessed for one injury, and they may all be valid, I'm not questioning the validity of them, but they overlap. The AMA guide says so, they've, consi that, they've considered that. It's a cerebral uh, disorder, it's a dysfunction of the brain that manifests itself in different ways. You give the, the injured worker whatever rates the highest. And when I say that, I'm, I would also point out that sometimes um, there may be different occupational adjustments. So if they're close, you may want to rate them out to see if, for instance, is the 25% WPI really going to end up higher than the 20% WPI? It may or may not. You may need to rate those out using the occupation and age adjustments to see if they, which one really is the highest. But it, it, it's pretty clear the 15 was not going to be above the 25. And the sleep disorder is precluded for 1-1-2013. So that makes it easy. So that's my spiel on cerebral impairments. Um, now I'm going to go through cranial nerves. And I've got a question. I can hardly wait. Yeah, there's a question from Mary. It's, uh, mm -hmm. have you seen Chapter 13 mental status be used for rating COVID long-haul symptoms? I have not yet. I, I, it may be, um, I'm going to make a couple of comments about COVID. We haven't seen a lot of COVID cases in there in, in yet, and probably for a couple of reasons, um, it's still too new. They may not be at MMI yet. Um, and recovery continues to come, but I have not seen this. Most of it still is what we're seeing is respiratory issues. Um, we're not seeing a whole lot of peripheral nerve or, or central nervous system impairments from COVID. At least we have not yet mm -hmm. in the ratings department. Thank you, Mary. So cranial, ner cranial nerves. Was that a two-part question? I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. Uh, cranial nerves, this is another <laughs> section where I had a difficult time figuring out what impairment number goes to what table. So here you go. <laughs> Here's an impairment number from the rating schedule matched to the different tables uh, and the different cranial nerves. So for your use and reference, put it in your rating schedule. Um, but I think that's that, that has helped me. Um, and uh, couple of different things here within the cranial nerves. Cranial nerve one, sense of smell. Uh, it gives on page 260, no, 262. It gives a maximum of 3%. There's not a table for that, but there's a narrative in chapter 13 says maximum 3%. Chapter 11, page 262, it talks about sense of smell with 1% to 5% WPI. So here we get a little bit of an inconsistency highlights that different groups of doctors combined, wrote each chapter. So it's a different group. So we got a slight inconsistency there. Uh, I just want to point that out. Um, cranial nerves, optic nerve, muscles of the eyes. For more detailed and more complex cases, those, those are addressed in chapter 12. 
So most of the time, vision isn't necessarily a nerve issue. It's just a, a loss of vision, which is more readily accomplished by evaluating with Chapter 12. The visual system is covered in more depth in Chapter 12. So if there is just loss of vision, that's probably where the doctor is going to go. But there are options. I, I wanted to point that out. Then I want to look at the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5. Doctors like to use that for headaches, and they're not supposed to. Uh, the DEU has offered, actually they made the determination quite some time ago, that um, headaches without um, objective findings, but actual history of direct trauma can be rated uh, using uh, they made up an impairment number, 13.01.00.99, maximum 3% WPI. They took that 3% WPI from Chapter 18. So they didn't just make it up. It's from Chapter 18, talks about pain add-on, a total of 3%. Um, and that's where they took it. So the trigeminal nerve uh, should not be used for uh, headaches. Trigeminal nerve should only be used if there's objective findings. The only legitimate impairment assignment in California work comp without objective findings at MMI is 3% for headaches if there's direct trauma. If there's objective findings, you don't get this headache, but you're gonna, there's going to be a higher WPI based on whatever that injury caused. Um, in every neuro, neurology report and many orthopedic reports, you're going to see a cranial nerve exam, or you should. Most of the time, you're going to see a cranial nerve exam, and it's usually pretty, pretty cursory where it's normal. Um, so anytime you see cranial nerve 5 assessed for headaches, I think, it's, I think it's wise to look at the exam documentation when the doctor says normal. There, there's no findings. Um, it should not be used this way. It's being taught that way to some of the doctors, uh, but it's not right. They're not being taught that way by the DEU or the administrative director or the medical unit or anybody like that. But um, they are being taught that they can use trigeminal nerve. They should not. This is how you rate headaches without objective findings. Um, here's some more tinnitus, uh, cranial nerve eight. Uh, that can be rated with hearing loss in Chapter 11. That's covered in that chapter as well. Uh, and then here I'm just identified what the cranial nerves were, what the impairment number, um, and, and that. And that's all I'm going to say about that because it's, uh, it, it doesn't come up that often, and it's um, uh, fairly complex to cover at this time. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next piece. I'm going to talk about Section 13.5, Chapter 13, Movement Disorders. Impairment due to station and gait disorders that can develop from a central nervous system or peripheral neurologic impairment. So Table 13.15, page 336 of the AMA Guides, looks like this. Um, and there's different uh, classes there that should be um, covered by um, objective findings. We see this table a lot as an Almaraz Guzman analogy, and <laughs> in my opinion, it's just because doctors find this easier. Uh, they can just look at this and pick a number and look at these different things. They, uh, I would point out, and I'm not the first person to point out, but class four. Uh, cannot stand without help, mechanical support, and or an assistive device. Um, there are doctors and attorneys, and even at least one work comp judge, that thinks that's vague enough that that could mean you could get 60% whole person impairment for one extremity. I interpret, reading the entire table, that the cannot stand without help 
um, it doesn't mean that you need somebody to, to you need to hold somebody's arm to stand up. That's somebody that physically cannot stand up without being lifted or a mechanical device or something. That's somebody that has true weight bearing issues uh, from a neurological perspective. Um, so again, I don't think my interpretation of chapter 13 and this table specifically does not lend itself to saying you can get 60% whole person for one lower extremity. The maximum for one lower extremity is 40% whole person. This is specifically a, a central nervous system injury that's causing inability to weight bear whatsoever or even to get yourself up. Uh, pretty, pretty much a more significant issue. Um, station and gate. Um, my personal opinion, having read through station and gate disorders from table 15-6 in chapter 15, and that's for corticospinal tract injuries, and table 13-15 here, and table 17-5 in chapter 17, is that they're all kind of sort of maybe trying to talk about the same thing, but not from different perspectives. And um, there's potential overlap with other lower extremity issues. And a question? Yeah, there's a question from Kim. Is uh, For headaches, I have a QME used chapter 18 with, with 3%. Does this make a difference? As should they have used chapter 13 instead? No, it's it's really not from any chapter, but that's how you rate it with the, the with that impairment number. Yeah, it's that's where that's where it originally came from. That's where the DU got that three percent was that's talked about in chapter 18. But they assigned an impairment number, so no, it doesn't matter what chapter. It does have to be direct trauma to the head. And then another question about table 1311 which is, uh, does post-concussion injury qualify the use for 1311? Which one's 1311? I gotta go back here. Pardon me, with trigeminal? trigeminal. Uh, if, if there truly is a trigeminal nerve injury, yes. Um, but if it's a post-concussive and it's there some other issue, cerebral issue, it should be evaluated that way. But if it really did injure the trigeminal nerve, then yeah, that that's appropriate. And you know, these these are cranial nerves. They're they're nerves that are running through the head, so they they can be damaged in a fall or a direct blow or something like that. I'm not I'm not suggesting that. I hope I didn't suggest that. They it's not that they can't be injured. It's just what we see the most is the trigeminal nerve for headaches. We don't re, we don't see much in the way of actual cranial nerve injuries. But if there's an actual cranial nerve injury from a direct blow or whatever the source, absolutely, that's appropriate to rate it that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. So with station and gate, just my conclusion is, I think there's potential for overlap. If station and gate is used from table 13, 15, even if it's legitimate, if it's a, if it's a, a a uh, central peripheral nervous system injury that causes a station and gait movement disorder. Um, it, there's probably some overlap if that right knee was also injured. And uh, there's probably overlapping ADL deficits. That's so, uh, something to look at, I think. Um, and it, uh, skipping back to chapter 17, which is the lower extremities, a gait evaluation is never combined with any other method. Uh, I, I think that speaks to that issue, that uh, there's there's likely overlap if the doctor is given another body part um, in the same lower extremity or a different, or, or in a lower extremity. Okay, go back to chapter 13 and upper extremities. There's a couple of different spots that upper extremities are covered in the, um, in chapter 13. If it's related to a central nervous system issue, um, one upper extremity is covered in table 1316. Two upper extremities are covered in table 1317. From any lesion in the brain is what it says. So this section covers any lesion of the brain. Table 1323 covers 
upper extremities due to chronic pain. And I'll, I'll go through that in a, in a bit. But so there's three tables that cover upper extremities in chapter 13. And so doctors, it's, it's an easy thing for the doctors. They don't really have to do any measuring. Um, they can go here and it's a much easier analogy. I don't have to do range of motion of all the digits. That's a pain. It's a pain to rate it, too, but uh, they don't have to do range of motion of the shoulder or the elbow. They don't have to calculate peripheral nerve impairments. They can go to one of these tables. It's an easy impairment to give. Um, they, it doesn't mean it's appropriate, but it's easy, and I understand that from the doctor's perspective. That's so much easier. If you're doing an analogy, boy, oh, boy, it's easy to go there. Um, what I do want to point out, all of these tables talk about digital dexterity. It's a common issue referenced in each table. So here, for instance, table 1316, um, the dominant extremity and the non-dominant extremity. This is a single upper extremity. At the, the narrative at the bottom, difficulty with digital dexterity. Um, no digital dexterity for class two. Uh, the third one does not mention digital dex dexterity, but I would assume if class one uh, has digital dexterity that anything worse is also going to have worsening digital dexterity. And that's the way I had interpreted it. I have seen doctors that say, well, chapter or class three doesn't say it digital dexterity, so that's okay. So full range of motion of the fingers and, and full pinch, I can still use class three because there's it doesn't say you need a uh, loss of digital dexterity. You do. I, I think reading the whole chapter and the entire table, I think it's clear that they're talking about a neurological disorder and there's problems with digital dexterity. That's, that's the hallmark of the issues um, from chapter 13 in the upper extremities. Table 1317 is for both upper extremities are affected and the same digital dexterity issues. So that's what I've got to say about those. I'm going to go now and look at section 13.7, the spinal cord. So a spinal cord injury could be evaluated using chapter 17, um, at least partially. I've got a question? Yeah, well, this is about uh, gait derangement. Some people are asking about the difference between chapter 17 and chapter 13. So we have... Uh, good question. Yeah, yeah one is... Specific question. Uh, if an injured worker had a failed back surgery and unable to walk or stand without a mechanical support, can the doctor use Chapter 13 or should they use Chapter 17? It depends on the cause. If, if a failed back surgery is kind of nonspecific, and I know doctors write that, but that's pretty nonspecific, um, that, that should be more specific from the doctor. Um, if it's if it's related to the injury in its spinal nerves um, as a result of spinal surgery, that's probably going to be addressed through the range of motion method for the spine. Uh, probably, if not, if it's uh, if it's it kind of depends. Um, chapter 17 gives a caution that if the lower extremity problem is because of a spine injury, it should be evaluated that way. It should not be evaluated separately. If it's a true neurological injury um, related to the spine surgery, it's probably going to be addressed through the range of motion method for the spine. Um, and I would say the range of motion method requires two levels or bilateral radiculopathy you're probably not going to have a failed back surgery unless you've got at least two levels involved. So the range of motion method probably is the right way to do that for the spine and and the, the lower extremity as a result of that. If it's a central nervous system injury that that independent of the spine, then we should be evaluated through chapter 13. If it's a lower extremity injury independent of the spine or the central nervous system, should be evaluated using chapter 17. Mm -hmm. so I hope I answered that. Yeah, I think you did. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So section 1317, the spinal cord, this this allows chapter six or 15 also allows 
uh, evaluation of different neurological, significant spinal cord neurological issues to be evaluated. So chapter 13 offers another option. Again, the authors of chapter 15 probably were not talking daily with the authors of chapter 13 and realizing that they were they were covering the same issues. They're pretty much covering the same issues in chapter 13. That's okay. The values are very similar. I think they might be identical. I don't see chapter 13 used often for that sort of thing, but it can be. It's in there and it can be. If it's a true spinal cord injury, probably better to go to chapter 15 because then you get the actual spine part included as well. Everything's Everything's there in one section. Um, chapter 13 does not have anything for evaluating the underlying spine injury if that's the result, uh, if, if, this, if the cord injury is a result of a spine injury. Again, these are <clears throat> probably more geared toward uh, a brain injury that's causing uh, a central nervous system injury with different residuals. I want to talk about chronic pain. Look and see how much time I got. I got about eight minutes, I think. Chronic pain. Chapter 13 covers chronic pain. It's another reason why I think it gets used by analogy quite a bit. Um, chapter 16 for the upper extremities seems to be that's where chronic pain is most frequent, is in an upper extremity, residuals from an upper extremity injury. And it's covered in more depth in chapter 16, or more specifics, not necessarily more depth, but more specifics in chapter 16. In chapter 13, it discusses chronic pain and it gives some specific uh, uh, diagnoses, uh, causalgia, post-traumatic neurology, and reflex sympathetic dystrophy. I don't think the differences make that, or the different diagnoses make any difference in the evaluation process, but maybe helps understand what was the cause and what objective findings to look for. And don't ask me because I don't remember what they are. I've got them written down somewhere, but not with me. Um, so table 1322 is used for lower extremity. Um, no, it isn't. It is used for upper extremity chronic pain. And table 1315, which we looked at earlier, is used again for chronic pain syndromes. And what I want to talk about, here's what chapter 1322 looks like uh, for chronic pain. These are by single extremity because that's the more frequent way for chronic pain, uh, true chronic pain to uh, um, manifest itself. It's one ex upper extremity. Sometimes it then creeps to the other upper extremity, but predominantly it's one extremity. And it's predominantly seems to be, and I'm not talking from a medical perspective, I'm talking about from what we see in ratings. Predominantly seems to be one upper extremity. And, and upper extremities, not lower extremities. Uh, but these should be from diagnosed chronic pain. I want to show this slide because it gives, uh, I, again, I, I gave you the uh, diagnoses and the impairment numbers, tried to match those up. Is that that was a chore for me. So uh, there you go. These are in in the slides that you'll be able to access. Um, but chronic pain, I, I want to talk about it. Chronic pain as a defined diagnosis. Um, I want to submit to you that chronic pain is a valid diagnosis talked about by the National Institute of Health probably most medical websites talk about chronic pain. It's got a, a legitimate diagnosis. Um, I thought I had it right there, but I don't. Um, it, it, and it's defined this way as I, on slide 45. Pain that lasts more than several months, variously defined as three to six months, but certainly longer than normal hearing, healing, I'm sorry. That's one of the definitions of chronic pain. That is not the AMA Guides definition of chronic pain. The AMA Guides has a different definition, and doctors, I think, sometimes think, want to use a more generic definition for chronic pain in the evaluation of such. The AMA Guide seems to me to be pretty specific. They're, they have specifics in mind with chronic pain and how that can affect people. 
and how that should be diagnosed with actual objective findings, this definition of chronic pain does not offer any objective basis to it. It's chronic pain. Um, the AMA guides in Chapter 13 and in Chapter 16 are talking about objective findings that confirm an actual diagnosis of chronic pain. It's not just subjective complaints of pain that lasts for several months, but n longer than normal healing. It's, it's an actual objectively based diagnosis. So I want to point that out. It's not, it's not just chronic pain. I still have pain, doctor. It's, it's a specific issue. Um, chapter 13, it talks about different things, swelling, skin changes, um, smooth, model, cold, sweaty. Um, RSD talks about without um, no nerve lesions, but still some objective findings, temperature changes, abnormal sweating, trophic changes, changes in the skin, nail, hair growth. Um, burning pain, swelling, skin changes for all three of the diagnosis in Chapter 13. Um, th there's objective findings, objective diagnostic studies that, that are required to offer a confirmed diagnosis of chronic pain. Chapter 16 talks about chronic pain, and here they're real specific on page 496, table 16.6. 1616, sorry about that, but um, more from table 1616 on slide 54. So my point is chronic pain, although it may be a legitimate diagnosis, may not be rateable and isn't rateable unless it's an objectively diagnosed chronic pain syndrome as defined in the AMA guide. So it's got to have these objective diagnoses. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to discount that people have pain, but it doesn't make it rateable in itself. Um, it should be diagnosed appropriately with objective findings is, is the, the issue I want to make. Chapter 17 talks a little bit about what chronic pain may be. There's objective findings. That, that, that's the hallmark of the AMA guide. Objective findings, permanent objective findings. Um, that is what, yeah, so here's a, there's an actual ICD-9 code for chronic pain due to trauma. It might be a working diagnosis, and it may be valid, but it doesn't support whole person impairment based on chronic pain necessarily. Um, I'm going to uh, just, I'm going to look at these, table 1323 and... 1324, 1323, the chapter 13, I don't see it used much at all, but these are sensory impairment. This is a, a table that uh, differs from the ones in chapter 16, but um, a doctor can use for, this is not a complete table, these are not whole person impairments, but these are for evaluating sensory deficits. Um, I do not include chapter or table 1324 for motor deficits. There's another one for motor deficits. So these are not whole person impairments. I just want to point it out. They come through every once in a while. The doctor will reference one of these, and they will they mistake these for whole person impairments. They're not. They're deficits. They're loss, which need to be applied to the maximum value of that identified nerve from either chapter 16 or chapter 17, whichever body part it is that it's addressed. So I just wanted to, to talk about those. Um, every once in a while, um, you might see multiple nerves combined, sensory and motor nerve impairments. And there's some, these impairment numbers are in the rating schedule. There's one for peripheral nerve system, sensory, motor, uh, for the spine, upper extremity, and lower extremity. So that's different than what the um, chapter 16 does, and it's different from what chapter 15 does. This combine, might combine sensory deficits from multiple nerves or motor deficits from multiple nerves. I think I've only seen it a couple of times from doctors, but it's in there, and a doctor might potentially evaluate nerve deficits that way. And I am going to wrap up. 
So I talked about this. We talked about cerebral impairments, page 308 and the instructions there. Um, there's a lot of potential duplication. So if you're looking at cerebral impairment, check it. Mental status. Uh, there's instructions that are oft missed by doctors that are doing the evaluations. Table 138 for emotional behavioral disorder or the GAF system, but not both. Cranial nerves, look for objective findings. Chapter 13, by analogy. By analogy doesn't mean you don't have to have objective findings. So that's what I have to tell you. Guzman and Kite, alternative WPI or alternative methods from the rating schedule are not automatic. Uh, the correct and statutory methods are automatic and it's gotta be rebutted. So that's what I have on chapter 13. And I think I have no current questions at this time. I believe so, so right, Kenny? Yeah, yeah, no questions. I appreciate your asking questions. I really do. I, I and participating in the in the polls at the beginning that really helps us understand uh, what we need to do, what we need to cover. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Kenny. Uh, just some final details here. You can access today's PowerPoint again on our website at bradfordbarthel.com under the education and then webinars page. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to sit with us for an hour. We appreciate okay, I, it. Take I just care. want to throw the gauntlet down, everybody. If, if you're interested in the rating department, which I strongly recommend, um, give it a shot. And uh, two, if you're interested in seeing what kind of work they do, I'm sure Tim and the crew would be more than happy to send you a um, edited um, example. We'll just strike out the names and uh, uh, give you some idea as to the hard work and detailed information they provide. Congratulations, Tim. I just volunteered you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Don. Appreciate this is it. This a way to celebrate your anniversary with the firm. Congratulations. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so Thanks much. Thanks so much, everybody. Have Thank a great you. day. Bye-bye.